Okay, so I'm going to stop the video there because we don't need to record me. We are going to be sharing the screen to record the question. So Tim, hope you're doing well. Thank you for answering the question so promptly. Um, so we'll go over them. Um, let's go ahead and share this. So I have them in different, um, uh, how would you say? different areas, if you also will go over like some, then it's going to be two videos, basically. So um, starting with, sorry, it's been a while since I've done one uh, Zoom like this before, or Zoom like this. So just give me a second to reacclimate here. I want my email to pop up. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. I'll be able to tell before I send it, so we'll start. So how we're actually going to answer these questions is a little bit different. And um, of course, um, my hope is that you have or will by the day to keep you on track and keep you motivated, have watched the session one through six. If you didn't watch it on the day of um, that it was assigned, if you will, the days that we watched it, you do have another instructor. I, I He's not as... Um, how would you say, lively. However, the information is still the same. So it might be a little bit more grueling to watch. However, the information is very good. So um, please, please do that. And we in this class are, are now doing, so I, how I'm doing this and this again, I don't want to go too far into it. It's a pilot class, right? So it's, we're kind of trying to build something and, and really try to set our RNs up for the best success that we possibly can. So um, what I have decided to do is not do, basically it's 75% Kaplan, but the other part is also critical thinking. And I, again, because you're not in class, so you don't get to hear me babble for three hours. Um, what I mean by that is, because it is going to come down to, you're going to come down to that fifth step. And I am actually going to be sending you something after I make the videos. I'm going to send everything at once. And it's a piece of paper. And I don't mean this in a religious way, but I call it like the Kaplan Bible. That's for me. It really is the decision tree. It says all the types of questions you can have, what steps you would use, what words and keywords there are. And then it gives other information that can be really, really useful. So I'm going to be sending that to you. I do ask that you please do not post this on social media. Don't um, post it anywhere. If you give it to anyone, um, please only your classmates. That's what I ask and trust from um, all of the students. It's very helpful. Okay, so now going back to what I said, we are gonna be using the decision tree on some of the questions, but on others, we are not. So the questions that we're gonna answer right now, we're actually not gonna use a decision tree. We're gonna use critical thinking, and um, more skill taking kind of, you know, like pointing certain things out. Um, there is a method to the madness. You get more of a miniature of that, but still I think it um, can be very useful. So let's begin. So number one, <clears throat> the family of a client with dementia visits, oh, by the way, these are all considered passing questions. These are all considered passing questions. If you have not seen the video yet, um, from Kaplan, you, you probably don't know what that means, but what that means is if you got any questions of these, there's passing and non-passing questions they ask. All the questions that we do every single time are always passing. So keep that in mind, please. Um, and there was one other thing that will probably pop back in my head. So number one, the family of a client with dementia visits the memory care unit for the first time. They express concern to the nurse caring for the relative about the client's unobserved wandering. Which of the following responses by the nurse would be most appropriate? Now, we are not using the Kaplan method with these specific questions, but if we were, I do like to mention this, um, we see the word most, so we know that it would be a priority question, we know we would use steps one through five, and even if you did do that, eventually you're going to come actually down to number five and use critical thinking anyway. So again, there is a method to my madness of how I picked the questions, why I did a certain order. And the questions that I'm actually picking in class are questions because I have tons more Kaplan questions that um, were not gone over in the video, which is a perk, of course. 
the more questions we can have, the better. And also on top of that, I'm picking questions that are kind of like, uh, this is a really weird question. How in the world would I, okay, would this even ever happen? What radioactive, what? And so I, I'm doing that on purpose for some of the questions and yes, does it make it a little bit harder for me to try to explain? And unfortunately you and I cannot go back and forth, but if you have questions, we can always talk or, you know, um, have a uh, uh, lingo, I'm sorry, uh, um, either on the phone, email, whatever, if, if you have any questions. So the first thing that I want to do is I, I really want to look at what is the question asking me? And that's why they always say the first thing you do, okay, what is the topic? What does this question really want to know? And what are the key things I want to point out? And key things that usually, just to point out, is you know, maybe there's an age, is there a diagnosis? Um, did this patient have a procedure or surgery? If they did, how long ago did they have it? Certain things like that, because that can really help us. We always at the end want to go back to that, back to the key clues and back to the topic, because sometimes we get lost when we're answering it and then we can actually answer it wrong. So, and we will do that as we go along. So I'm looking here and I, I see that I have a family member who is concerned. I have a concerned family member. So really that is my topic. I have a concerned family member in regards to their family member um, eloping, basically um, wandering away. And that can be very anxiety ridden. So these questions that I picked, a lot of them are actually priority, but slash therapeutic. And that's why I say, because if you look, when I send you the sheet, therapeutic questions, you only use steps one through five. Step one is identify the topic. Step five is best outcome. Step one, we know how to identify the topic. Step five, you go straight into best outcome. What does that mean? That means you're strictly using your critical thinking. So that's why I don't want to just focus on going through every single time the Kaplan method, just because it says most. Hopefully that makes sense. I think it does. Um, but if not, please let me know. That's why I'm doing, I just want you to understand. I think it's important for people to understand why we're doing things the way we're doing them. Um, so, okay. What else might stick out? Um, we have a patient with dementia. They're in a memory care unit and we have an anxious family member who, and they're new. It says right there. First time it's their first time. I'd be scared too. This is something that wouldn't, create a lot of um, anxiety. And I would want as the nurse to help put my patient's family member at ease without um, false reassurance. There's all of those sorts of things as well. So let's get into it here. So number one, it is all right. So already, I don't like this. It is all right. That's just kind of condescent. Condon, oh my goodness, I'm not a very good speaker all the time condescending, con condescending. There we go. Um, we will take care of your family member safely. Uh, I don't like that question or I'm sorry, that, um, response you, as you know, um, through, if you've watched the sessions as well, you know, we never want to say, oh, it's going to be okay. Or it's all right. Or we don't know. We don't know. And, and again, it's, it's kind of a rude thing to say. It's not therapeutic. So I don't like it. I'm not going to um, get rid of it off the bat, but I, I don't like it. I'm going to keep it and see what else we have because we don't know what else we have. Number two, we use wristbands that signal if clients exit the door. Okay. I, that's somewhat reassuring. I mean, meaning that there's going to be some sort of alarm if we can't tie people down, right? So if someone's saying, oh, I'm, you know, I see people wandering around, I'm afraid my family member's going to get out. If I, you know, hear, okay, there's a wristband. Remember, the NCLEX is all about safety. Is that going to alarm the staff that, hey, somebody is getting out of the door, boom, safety, I know where they're going. Okay. I, I don't, oh my God, love the answer. I wish it was, you know, but which one do I like better, number one or number two? Definitely number two. So now I feel comfortable eliminating number one because I would definitely say number two before I would say number one or I would not say number one. Then we go to number three. Let's compare those two. 
I worry about the same thing with my mother for many years. This is the nurse making it about the nurse. It is not about the nurse. Delete, gone, bye. So I delete and get rid of that one. Number two is definitely much better. It's about the patient and it's helping to try to ease the anxiety in regards to safety. So now we're left with number two and number four. So number four, we have a superb staff to client ratio set so that it is not something that can take place. Now, the beginning of this, I like. We have a superb staff to client ratio. That is excellent. That is safety. That is um, trying to reassure the client that, or the, I'm sorry, the client's mother, that we have a lot of people here to keep a close eye. However, it's the ending that ruins it. So nothing can happen. I can't promise you that nothing can happen. I'm giving false reassurance. So I can't use this. And I mean, this would not be a therapeutic answer. It wouldn't be um, something that we would want to say to our patient's um, family member to help with their anxiety because it is false reassurance. So that would leave us with the credited answer of being number two, which would be we use wristbands at signal if clients exit the door. And I know that they, they, I'm repeating some things. It's just kind of within you when you know Kaplan, but sometimes we don't always love the answers that we get. So, I, I mean, I don't love this answer and I would like more to it, but it, you know, we have to, they, they can't write paragraphs here. I mean, we'd be taking NCLEX forever. Um, but out of these four answers, number two is the most reassuring. You're not giving false reassurance. You're not being condescending. I can't say, you know what I mean? Um, and it's the most, therapeutic. So the answer is number two. And I don't have yours pulled up, so I don't know what you put. So, but you do now that I'm telling you. Okay. And I'll um, go back and of course, like comment. All right. Number two, the RN is gathering data for a client who is being treated for OCD. Which of the following is most important for the, sorry, I typed this really fast. Most important question for the nurse to ask the client. Okay. So I see the word most and I see OCD. I know this is going to be a therapeutic question. Same thing. It's therapeutic. I could go through all um, parts of the decision tree because I see the word most. However, I know I'm going to get down to number, I'm going to do with number one, which is the topic and five, which is the best outcome. So for me, I'm comfortable just jumping in and going one and five instead of having to go through one through five. So you have to make that decision when you, if you feel really confident and you're doing thousands, thousands and thousands of questions and you're really getting it down, that's just a, a decision you need to make. Um, but again, we're more focusing on the skill part here at this point. So our topic is, is that we have a patient. Okay. We have a, um, diagnosis who, um, this patient is suffering with, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And we want to know, for us, what is the most important thing that we want to ask the client? So the topic is basically therapeutic communication with a patient who has OCD. Okay. Or being treated for OCD. So number one, would it be therapeutic if the nurse said to a patient with OCD, do you find yourself forgetting simple things? I'm going to read all of these. Number two, do you find it hard to stay on task? Number three, do you have trouble controlling upsetting thoughts? Or number four, do you experience feelings of panic in a closed area? Now, I chose this question on purpose because I personally find it difficult. I find it difficult because most um, students tend to choose one, two, or three. And that's because one, two, and three are all correct, really, truly, right? It always comes down to usually two. But if you are so preoccupied with your thoughts and your compulsions, yeah, I can see. And, and remember, OCD is an anxiety disorder. So, and, if, and by the way, um, if you, while you're going through things, if you see or read or hear something that you aren't as familiar with, just write that down real quick. Just say OCD, just to know that, oh, you know what? I just want to review it real quick. Don't take notes. Well, I don't advise taking notes while we're going through it. Um. So yeah, I could totally see I'm going to potentially have that um, happen to me for getting simple things when I'm preoccupied with th this um, disorder. And number two, do, do you find it hard to stay on task? Same thing. I'm preoccupied. I'm thinking about, oh my God, my family's going to die. They don't wash my hands this many times, or I'm going to, you know, contract 
COVID for sure, because I'm not wearing gloves today. I forgot them at home or whatever it may be. I have to flip the light switch and I'll, whatever the, the it is. And then number three, do you have trouble controlling upsetting thoughts? Absolutely. Yes, that is what OCD is. Number four, totally different. So if you, this is a trick. So I'm looking at these and these are all naming disorders. So if we look at it, so what is number four naming? Do you experience feelings of panic in a close area? Claustrophobia, okay. Do you find your, so that's why we can kind of help by opening up our mind and looking at, at everything and trying our very best. And remember, if you get one wrong, please just, you know what? Then you got one wrong. It's over. Just, or if you feel you got one wrong or you're not sure, you, you do your very best and you move on and then you move on because then you're probably going to get the next three, right? And you just got to stay above that passing level, 50% correct above the passing level. And remember on these tests, 60 is the new 90. So keep that in mind. If you're getting like, for example, somebody had um, text it or emailed or whatnot, you know, cause they'd show me their scores and, um, they did one of their tests, a sample test. And they got, I believe a 62. And I was like, wow, that's ex- that, that's very good. Cause I believe at 65%, I have to double check, um, that hasn't changed is when Kaplan feels you're ready to actually take your test. So my hope with this is to help build confidence. All of these things can really be helpful. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm like slipping things in of the support and, and, but you're not in class, so I want you to hear it. It will not always be this long. Um, and these can't be that long, otherwise they don't send. Okay, so I'm starting to see a trend here. These are all diagnoses. Which one best fits OCD? So number four is claustrophobia. Do you find yourself forgetting simple things? What could that possibly be? Dementia. Okay, so now I have two and three. Do you find it hard to stay on task or do you have trouble controlling upsetting thoughts? Which one is more closely related to OCD? What is number two mostly more related to? Like ADD, right? ADD, ADHD? So number three would actually be your, your correct answer. Do you have trouble controlling ups, your upsetting thoughts? Because that would be absolutely correct and true. Now, if I didn't think out kind of in a broader area and think about, oh, wait, they're naming different diagnoses, I may not have gotten to that um, conclusion. So again, just something to think about. But these things do happen too. So you're not going to like every question. It just is what it is. I don't like every question. Some of them I'm like, this is really, really. And we um, go over some of those. <laughs> okay. Like this, this one's kind of interesting, actually. And I hopefully I'll give you a little trick here. So a client diagnosed with multiple myeloma um, is admitted to the unit after developing pneumonia. So we already have an actual diagnosis, which is um, cancer of the blood, is admitted to the unit after developing pneumonia. So pneumonia is the actual diagnosis of why the patient is there, but we know they're immunocompromised because of the white blood cell count, right? So when the RN enters the client's room wearing a mask, the client says in an irritated tone of voice, why are you wearing that mask? Which of the following responses is best by the RN? Okay. So we have a patient that is not happy. That's really good to understand. We see the word best. So we know technically it'd be um, steps one through five. I already know it's going to be a therapeutic question. Um, And again, we're focusing more on, um, we're not doing the the Kaplan method in this moment. We're doing more um, strategies, Um, but they interconnect. So I'm not going to do steps one through five, even though you normally would. We're going to go right to five because I already know it's therapeutic. Um, We're going to go to one, which is the topic. The topic is upset patient in regards uh, to RN wearing a mask. So our patient, we don't know if the the cancer has anything to do with it, um, but we do know that they're there for pneumonia, that the nurse is wearing the mask and is not happy. So what can we say to this patient that is 
proper. This is also has to do with scope of practice and you'll see as we read it, and this is very important to understand too, is scope of practice. So that's why we don't use our own experience. So scope of practice, if at my job, I'm allowed to do finger sticks, I, I think this is the same. Judy, or the woman who did the original, um, not our Judy, Miss B, but she actually trained me. So we, I like, we have a lot of the same verbiage and examples, but let's say at your job, you're allowed to do finger six as a CNA, but at my job, we're not allowed to do finger six. In, in the, the protocols and procedures is what tells you because actually CNAs are allowed to do finger six in California. So one of us would get it right on our test and one of us would get it wrong. That's why it's, we don't want to go by our own experience. We want to go by what we can actually do. And the, the paper I'm going to send you will help you with the scope of practice as well. Okay, so number one, what are we, what are we going to say to this upset person, our patient? Number one, the chest x-ray taken this morning indicates you have pneumonia. I am giving this patient a diagnosis. I don't know if they know they have diagnosis, uh, pneumonia. I don't know what, I don't know what they know. I'm, I have no idea. So I'm not liking that. Number two, what have you been told about the x-rays that were taken this morning? I like that. It's going to be a little awkward if the guy's already upset and is like, no, why, what? And then you have to like leave the room and get the doctor, (laughs) but hopefully, uh, you know, we can be therapeutic and make it work. Number three, you have been placed on contact precautions due to your infection. Now, do number one and number three look similar? Are you diagnosing your patient with both of those? Yes, you are. You're telling them. Number three is telling them, I'm taking contact precautions due to your infection. I don't know if they know they have an infection. I'm not, that's not what I'm, my scope of practice. And number one, same thing. So if this is not a select all that apply, this is probably my favorite, one of my favorite tricks when I answer questions. If it's a not all that apply question and two answers are very similar, usually you can get rid of them. So I'm getting rid of number one and number three off the bat because you're out, out of your scope of practice. And now I'm left with two and four. So number four then now is saying, I am here to protect, I am, sorry, I am trying to protect you from the germs in the hospital. Well, if that were the case, who would be wearing the mask? The, the patient, not the nurse, right? So number four is not correct. So they, even if we don't like it, if it's not, and, and I don't really like the wording, it's still the best answer, which is because we always want to know what the patient knows. What have you been told about the x-rays that were taken this morning? Because you're, work, you're just walking in as a nurse. You don't know what's going on. You're just checking on your patient. And so that's going to be the most therapeutic answer. Okay, let's continue. Um, doo, doo, doo. I'm just seeing what I, how far I want to go. Because I like to usually do these by threes. One, two, three. I'm actually going to stop here only because A, I don't want to run out of time because it only lets me, oh, I, oh, I record on YouTube now. So it doesn't matter. Okay. And then I erase it. Don't worry. Um, but then I can send it to you like that. So let's just finish that way. You don't have to watch tons of videos. Okay. Number four, the RN is caring for clients in the outpatient clinic. Which of the following clients should the nurse see first? Okay. So we know that we have a priority type question. Um, it doesn't really give me that much information about a topic. So if it doesn't give us a lot of information about a topic and we like topics because we can go back to the topic and see if, and not, you know, for therapeutic questions, it's not as much of going back. It's more when we get into the decision tree, we go back and say, does this make sense? Um, and again, as we continue moving forward, it, you'll see all of my methods. So, which is awesome. So you get the methods from the sessions, right? And then you get my methods and then you have your methods and then you have all the methods that you've learned. So you just get a wealth of information, which I think is amazing. So I don't really know what's going on with this patient. There's just a patient that we're caring for. Um, So let's read the answer choices to hopefully get a topic. So number one, a client with hepatitis A who states, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. I totally, hello. 
Yes, we do. This is a who do you see first question, which we use um, steps one through five of the, of the decision tree. Just like I said, I, I chose this on purpose, all one through five. So we need the topic and we need the um, uh, best outcome. So the topic is who are we gonna see first? Who is, who's gonna die first if we don't see them, basically? We don't want anyone to die. Who's gonna die first if we don't, yeah. Who's gonna die first or lose a limb or life threatening? Okay, so is it gonna be a client with hepatitis A who states my arms and legs are itchy? How do we get, or what is hepatitis A? Always think with hepatitis, I always kind of think of it like this. Hepatitis B, that's the one we always have to get the shot for for nursing school, ow, sets of three, mm, don't like it. C, typically has to do with drug use, not always, but typically. And A, that's the one um, that has to do with feces. So just as a side note, if you didn't know that, jot it down. Or remember, if it, it not, I don't know you well enough to know your, um, your, uh, your study set and kind of how you do things. But my arms and legs are itchy. I, would, I do like to give a little bit of content. And now that I know I'm doing this on YouTube, I'll give you a little bit here and there. But I don't want to make it too long only because I still have to... Um, do stuff for the Kaplan class for in-person as well. However, I want you to uh, get the, the most that I can give you. So my legs and arms are itchy. Is that uncomfortable? Yes. Is this person going to die from that? No. So why are their legs and why are they itchy? More than likely, it has to do with the bilirubin. So our red blood cells, they um, regenerate about every 90 to 120 days. Um, they die. Your liver is responsible for basically recycling them. And if your liver's not functioning properly because you have hepatitis, right? Hep, liver, itis, inflammation, then what's going to happen? Unfortunately, you're going to get a buildup of red blood cells. And red blood cells, unfortunately, um, once they die, they turn into bilirubin. And bilirubin has that hue kind of tint of green yellow and that's why we see people with jaundice but it also causes itching that's one reason there's a couple other but just uh, food for thought for content um so I'm, it's probably not going to be this person that we see first number two a client with a cast on the right leg who states i have a funny feeling in my right leg it's important to read that carefully because what if they'll try to trick you the NCLEX is mean we'll try to oh a client has a cast on the right leg who states that i have a funny feeling in my left leg so make sure you read it carefully this one is not like that and this this concerns me a lot why potential compartment syndrome what can happen with potential compartment syndrome lack of blood flow how are the pulses could lose a limb this is important so if i had to choose between one and two which one am i getting rid of getting rid of number one so i'm going to keep number two Number three, a client with osteomyelitis of the spine who states, I am so nauseous that I am not able to eat. I absolutely care that they can't eat. I want them to eat. It's important to eat for strength, for health, to get better, all of that. But, in, and remember, it, we're going to see all of them. We're going to see all of these patients. It's just who are we going to see first? Who's the most acute? So this person compared to number two is not the most acute. So Number two is going to come before number three. So I'm going to get still rid of number one, number three, keep number two. So now let's go down to number our second number three, which is a client with a uh, rheumatoid arthritis who states, I am having trouble sleeping. Sleeping is absolutely important. You will die before, um, you will actually die without sleep faster than without food. Fun, fun fact. However, I'm having trouble sleeping compared to I might have compartment syndrome and lose my leg. What's most important right this second or right now, it's going to be number two. So your correct answer is going to be number two. And I think you um, got that one right. I think I, I think I saw that one real quick. Okay, two more. Number five, we have more, but for right now, we're going to do these. Number five, which of the following assignments should the LVN question? love this. So we, so that we don't get confused, I like to answer these questions like this. Number one, first of all, I want to think of, okay, what is an LVN scope of practice? Now, 
I only say this for the NCLEX and I have nothing but the utmost respect for, I, I was an LVN. Um, I have nothing but most respect for CNAs, for any type of tax. It takes a, it takes a team, right? A village. How, how, and it's even hard for me to say out loud, but in the NCLEX world, RNs are looked to, they're almost looked as like these, uh, as like the doctor kind of almost not now. I don't mean like prescription, prescription and all that, but they're looked at like the, the Holy grail, if you will, LVNs, like are only given stable because we know it's not real world but keeping this in mind you know are given very simple tasks so just keeping that in mind um i don't like it but i can't change it i'm not writing the questions but that that that's what i've definitely noticed answering thousands of questions okay so we're looking for something wrong and that's actually on um our decision tree there is a look, looking for something wrong and it steps one through five and like basically which one is correct versus not. So how I like to answer this is like this. Which of the following assignments should the LVN question? What is our topic? Our topic is which one of these is wrong? So I would say, would it be incorrect if the LV, or I'm sorry, would it be appropriate for the LVN to question a client with a chest tube who is ambulating in the hallway. Would it be correct if the LVN questioned a client with a colostomy irrigation who requires assistance with a colostomy irrigation? Number three, would it be correct if the client questioned a client with right-sided CVA who requires assistance with bathing, or would it be correct if, a, if the LVN questioned a client who stated, I'm sorry, a client who is refusing medication to treat cancer of the colon? Because remember, we're looking for something wrong. Which of the following assignments should the nurse, the, the LVN question? So what we're looking for usually is something the RN would do um, teaching, um, usually has to do more with teaching first, um, admittance, but you see how I kept going back so that I would remember that I'm looking for something wrong rather than getting confused and saying, oh shoot. Or if I, I you can go back and forth. And I think I did that. I said, is, would you question it if it's, if this is right or if it's wrong so that I remember that I'm looking for something wrong. So, by looking at all of these, um, a client with a chest tube who is ambulating in the hallway is actually considered a stable procedure and the OVN can do this. This is fine. If you don't know that, let's just hold on to it. Let's just say, I don't know. I have no idea. Because to be completely honest with you, when I first read this, I was like, uh, number one and number two, they don't seem like uh, if it's the Holy Grail, uh, that seems dangerous. <laughs> or potentially. Um, number two, a client with colostomy irrigation. We already read that. Number three, a client with a right-sided CVA who requires assistance with bathing, who would do that? The NAP. And then number four, a client who is refusing medication to treat cancer of the colon. So which one of these is going to require more of uh, teaching and not convincing, but educating so that the patient can make the best educated guess? It would actually be number four. The LVN is qualified to do the standard procedures with expected outcomes, which would be, I mean, we can't always expect things to go the way they're supposed to, but they can do number one. Um, remember, chest tubes are usually um, sewn in, so they're not um, just hanging there. Um, and then number two, uh, we can irrigate a colostomy bag or LVNs. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. So teaching, think teaching, teaching, teaching. So cancer teaching, if you're going to hospice, you're being transferred to another unit, that's usually RN. All right, last one for right now. Number six, the RN carries out the plan of care of a client with anemia who is reporting weakness. Okay, that makes sense. Which of the following tasks could be assigned to the NAP? Okay, who, which one of these patients is a CNA going to get? 
So again, let's use critical thinking, not the decision tree. Who is the NAP gonna see? This, I like this question. Easy, easy, easy. All right, so number one, are they gonna listen to clients' breath sounds? No, why? That's assessment. Is that within their scope of practice? No, absolutely not, cross it out. Number two, set up the client's lunch tray. Is that within their scope of practice? It is, hold on to it. Number three, obtain a diet history. Is that within their scope of practice? No, that is assessment. Number four, instruct the client how to use a cane correctly to prevent a safety issue. Is that, is that teaching and is that within their scope of practice? No, so we would get rid of that one. So the only one of these four things that is within a CNA scope of practice is to set up the client's lunch tray. So the answer would be number two. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope I gave kind of enough kind of little tricks, hints, things, um, and it was pretty quick and concise so that you, you know, have some time to listen to it. And um, I will do another video. It may not be today, uh, but we'll, we'll still continue conversing. I'll give you some more, um, I'm air quoting right now, homework, um, just, just to kind of, again, help support, be there for you. And if you need anything, I think you have my phone number, but it's 408-477-0995. Don't hesitate. I think it says at the bottom of my thing on my email, but uh, don't hesitate to text. Um, and yeah, um, I hope you have a good rest of your night and I will correct the rest of your stuff um, this week for sure. All right. Thank you.